All right, lesson six, the life of Christ. Lesson six, the life of Christ. Luke chapter number eight and verse number one. Now, very interesting, uh, this uh, uh, study, because we have come to uh, the men in the life of Christ. Now, men in general, men in general, uh, man in general, man is the human race. Then it's identified down to male and female. And uh, we understand that, that God made both male and female. But a lot of times in the Bible, when it talks uh, uh, about men, it talks about it's appointed unto uh, man once to die. Well, that's male and female. So when we look under the heading of the men in the life of Christ, we first talked about the men in the life of Christ. And you remember uh, how we looked at that in our last lesson. Well, tonight, I want to focus on the women. The women in his life, the life of Christ. Look in eight, chapter 8 and verse 1. Uh, of all the scriptures that we could read about the women in the life of Christ, uh, I thought this one interesting. Luke 8, chapter 1. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, Joanna, the wife of Chuzza, Herod steward, and Susanna, and many others which minister unto him of their substance. Interesting, isn't it? In verse number 1, the Bible says, And the twelve were with him, speaking of the men. And then the very next verse says, And certain women. He names uh, a few of them, three of them, Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, and Susanna. And uh, then uh, he makes a comment here in verse 3, and many others, and pertaining to the women. There were many women. So I want to look at this, uh, because this is really an odd thing, uh, that Jesus would have women in his life, in his ministry. Now I want to say something to you. Don't, don't uh, get like the worldly crowd that's tried to write about Jesus and sinfulness toward women and even Jesus and sinfulness toward men. Uh, they write about David and Jonathan and their sinful love and the world's all time looking for some drama to write about whether it's a biblical character or a fictional character. So when we talk about the women in the life of Christ to uh, understand that we mean uh, disciples even as women. Not just were men disciples, but women were disciples as well, followers of Christ. I'm going to say some things in this study that might not uh, go right with our Baptist tradition, but the fact of the matter is uh, that Jesus used women uh, and Jesus used men uh, to carry out the message of the gospel, and he made no apologies about that. Now in your notes, and we'll follow them closely tonight uh, to get done, notice uh, uh, some of the things that I put historically speaking. The place of women in the first century Roman world uh, and in Judaism uh, has been well documented and set forth in many historical writings. Generally speaking, women were regarded as second class citizens. When Jesus comes on the scene in the human body, when Jesus was born uh, of a virgin, women uh, were looked at uh, as second-class citizens. Not only in uh, the Roman world, but even in Jewish eyes a lot of times. Matter of fact, uh, Jewish uh, um, leaders and Jewish uh, uh, rabbis and those of uh, great position they talked about that threefold blessing. Some of you will remember that if you've ever studied some of the prayers of the Jewish uh, rabbis. Uh, 
Uh, one was a threefold blessing prayer. Blessed are you, O God, King of the universe, who has not made me, and they concluded respectively, a Gentile, a slave, and a woman. They talked about how that you have created me a human, not a beast, a man, not a woman, an Israelite, not a Gentile, circumcised, not uncircumcised, free, and not slave. I was looking historical at this uh, because I want to uh, bring out just the setting of Jesus' day and how women were looked at and we're talking about the earthly life of Christ and we want to look at how he responded to women in his day. The Greek poet, he saw it. He was uh, from uh, 750 to 650 B.C. warned against women claiming a flattering woman just wants a man simply for his possessions. A lot of times if a woman was given any uh, prop, it was that she was up to no good. Others, I hope you understand I'm teaching the class and so I'll call them what I want to call them. I don't uh, always say names right. Uh, Aristotle. Some have called him Aristotle. Well, I just call him Aristotle. He viewed women as inferior to men when it came to leadership. Aristotle said that man is by nature superior to the female, and so the man should rule and the woman should be ruled. Statement and orator. Pericles. Pericles however you want to pronounce his name. He was a political leader. He said a woman a woman's reputation is highest when men say little about her, whether it be good or evil. In a court of law, a woman's testimony would not have held up back then. And so the women first witnessing the resurrection would have made the story far less credible to the contemporary of that time. And it's interesting that some have called Jesus' regard for women uh, as revolutionary for his day and his time because Jesus gave them uh, the time of day. So I want you to understand how women were viewed. And before we do this study tonight, I want to say to us as Baptist churches that sometimes we fear women and so we belittle them and we put them uh, as lesser even though the Bible does speak of a woman as the weaker vessel in uh, statue and in humanity, uh, let me just remind you that all are even at the cross. Uh, there is uh, no Jew or Gentile. There is no male or female. Uh, and some of the greatest spiritual people that you'll ever meet in your life uh, is women. And I say that because when you look at the life of Christ and the earthly ministry of Christ, you're going to find that Jesus Christ took time with the women just like he took time with the men. And I don't know that he had, didn't have a whole lot less issues with the women of his day than he did the men of his day. It was a very odd thing that the women of his day would even uh, raise their head up to him, more or less speak to him, more or less have anything to do with him for fear of what could happen. But it was even greater odd uh, or an oddity that Jesus would even have anything to do with them. So I want to make some points tonight about the earthly life of Christ uh, and the women uh, and I want to remind you that uh, we see the same thing running true in the ministry of Paul and in the writings of Paul, uh, how that women uh, were vital to getting the gospel to the world. Notice, if you will, in your notes, his company of women. I picked this chapter here because just to give you my thoughts that I had as I began to look across the Gospels, uh, I noticed the company of his women, uh, the women uh, that accompanied Christ. Uh, contrary to many beliefs, Jesus had a lot of women around him during his earthly ministry. Matter of fact, in uh, these three verses, we see the main names, 
Notice Mary called Magdalene. I, I put in your notes there was the main Marys. <laughs> Jesus had all kind of Marys. Mary his mother, Mary the sister of Lazarus, and Martha, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and, uh, and uh, Joseph. I mean, all kinds of Marys. Remember I told you in the study of Joseph and Mary that Mary was the popular name. Not only in our day, Maria is the most popular name, but Mary was a popular name in the day of Jesus. And so he had a lot of Marys in his life. And they are the main names. What about Martha? I mean, how many of us know Martha? She's the sister that was upset because... Uh, the main name Mary was at his feet while she was trying to fix the meal. And then, uh, of course, uh, there are some uh, people in his uh, ministry that didn't actually have a particular name, but they are main name people because we know them, such as the woman at the well. These are vital characters in our Christian doctrine. Why, well, you preach a message on salvation and the woman at the well uh, uh, in uh, John uh, 4 comes to mind, doesn't she? Because she is uh, a great picture of how God saves a sinner. And then once that sinner is saved, they go and tell and publish uh, the salvation story. Then I thought about the woman caught in adultery. Matter of fact, that's their name to us. I mean, that's how we name them. Oh, you know that woman at the well. That's her name to us. Or that woman caught in adultery. Remember when Jesus rode in the sand? You remember that woman? And so they are some main name women in his life. Early in his life. Elizabeth. Early in his life. Anna. I mean, what about Anna? Uh, there in the temple. No doubt uh, very instrumental in the early days of the life of Jesus. But here in our text there are some lesser names. Lesser names. Well, Joanna is a lesser name. We really don't know a whole lot about her. And Susanna, we don't know a whole lot about her. But here they are. We do know one thing, uh, that these women, uh, Joanna and Susanna, they uh, ministered unto Jesus uh, of their substance. Now that's interesting, isn't it? These lesser names... Uh, these uh, people that may not get mentioned but once or twice. And then, and then uh, of course, uh, there are the no names, uh, as I put in your notes. Uh, that's the many others. See them in verse 3? But one thing about it, they all uh, ministered to Him of their substance. Now, according to what the substance was, I'm sure was uh, the deciding factor on how much was ministered. But there's no doubt that these women uh, possess substance uh, and that aided uh, to the ministry of Christ uh, when He came into the cities uh, where He was fed, uh, where He was housed, uh, where He was clothed. Uh, uh, all of the things that took place, uh, these women had a great uh, influence and these women had a great part uh, in the financial ministry of Christ. Now, I'm preaching on the life of Christ, so I don't want to jump into the life of the apostles in the early church. But let me just remind you of something tonight, that in the early church, uh, some of the greatest givers uh, and some of the greatest substance bearers in all the New Testament was women. Women. Lydia comes to mind. She had a house. She had a business. Aquila comes to mind. She had a house. She had a business. I could go on to talk about that, but let me just tell you something about women in the life of Christ. Uh, uh, let's quit belittling uh, women and their place in uh, the Bible because in the life of Christ, not only were they there to minister to His needs, uh, they ministered to Him with their substance. Very interesting in his day. The lesser names, the no names. Although these women go unnamed in the gospel, they gave up time, talents, 
and their own livelihoods to follow him. In a time where women could not associate with men from outside their family, they sacrificed social standing, family strain, and likely a loss of friendships to follow him. But they did so gladly, and many stood loyal and remained to receive the Holy Ghost uh, in the book of Acts chapter number 2. And in the book of Acts chapter number 1, we find in verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. He's talking about the disciples, the apostles. In our chapter, in Luke chapter 8, in verse number 1, who was with him? The twelve, the disciples, the apostles. Who else was with him? Certain women and other women, many women. And so when we think about this, this, this listen to me now, this not only was during his ministry, but it went on beyond his ministry all the way to the day of Pentecost. It was not just men who were filled with the Holy Ghost and not just men. Matter of fact, uh, uh, Joel prophesied about it uh, that sons and daughters would have a pouring out of the Spirit of God. And so we find that. When we look at this company of women, uh, I just want to remind you uh, that uh, there is uh, something about the mindset in the ministry of women that sometimes takes a second seat uh, and uh, it's not a second seat in position and in authority and in uh, a role in the church. Uh, most of the time, it's just a mentality of men. They look at women as uh, secondary. And let me just tell you, if that's how you look at women, uh, you'd have fit right in in Jesus' day. The only problem would have been Jesus wouldn't have been your friend about that. Notice, if you will, uh, the company of women, uh, the compassion toward women. Notice uh, that it is remarkable that Jesus even spake and spoke to women. But when he did, Jesus spoke in a thoughtful, caring manner. He regularly addressed women directly while in public. Everybody listen to me. This is what's remarkable. Not only was women not to be talking to men outside their family, but men outside their family were not supposed to be talking to women outside their family. Uh, it was just shunned on. It was just looked down on. It was, uh, it was almost uh, uh, rude. It was disrespectful. And it was almost leveled as a sin. Here comes Jesus, and not only is he looking women in the eye, not only is he taking time uh, to be around them, uh, but he is addressing them, and he's not doing it just privately to get uh, out of the public's view and persecution of that. Jesus uh, addressed men publicly, and he addressed women publicly. Very interesting as we study this. Now remember, you're in a Bible college setting. We're not in a camp meeting. We're not in a Bible conference. Uh, uh, we're in a, in a Bible study. So we're studying these. So all this, this right here is boring. Well, if the Bible's boring to you, you need to be in this class. Amen? You need to be in. But I'm trying to show you uh, how that women in the life of Christ uh, were spoken to publicly because of His compassion. Let me give you a few things right here. Now, it was unusual, and the disciples revealed that in John chapter 4 and verse 27. You know, when he was talking to the woman at the well, this is what the Bible says in John 4, 27. And upon this came his disciples. They came up to this conversation at the well and marveled that he talked with the woman. They couldn't believe that Jesus would take time, number one, just to even be around a woman such as this. But that he would actually have a dialogue, that he would talk with her. It's very interesting. Uh, Yet no man said, what seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? This is a scratch your head moment if you're a disciple. You're like, is that Jesus? Is he over there at the well? Well, what's he seeking? What's he doing at the well? And then, why is he talking to that woman at the well? 
It's very interesting that the disciples revealed the culture just in their question. They marveled that he talked with her, and, 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 and in their heart they questioned it, but no man said anything. He also spoke freely to the woman taken in adultery. John 8, 10, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Do you remember Jesus just told them, Hey, if you got, if you got no sin, won't you throw a stone? The first one of you with no sin, cast a stone. Well, they all end up walking away. And the shocking thing, the most shocking thing was, was uh, that Jesus forgave her, no doubt about that. He said, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. But it was even more shocking that Jesus was even having a conversation uh, with a woman in public and especially a woman such as the woman at the well that had five husbands uh, and, and the man she was living with was not even her husband. Uh, and now he's talking to a woman that had been caught in adultery in public in front of people and in both instances he is showing them compassion. Compassion. They're not getting compassion from the disciples. What's he talking to her for? They're not getting compassion from the priest and the, and, and the higher ups of the religious crowd in Jesus' day. They're wanting to stone this woman. Jesus is wanting to forgive this woman and see her live her life uh, in a different way. Jesus and his compassion toward women. Jesus spoke publicly with the winner of name. You remember that? I put a bunch of verses in there. We won't, uh, we, we, we won't read them all, but I, just so you will have them, Luke 7, uh, verses 11 through 17. Uh, you know, he, he came, uh, and of course he said in verse 14, uh, he, he told the young man, he said, I say unto thee, arise. And that's usually what's preached. But, but you see, when the Lord saw her in verse number 13, what happened? He had compassion on her and then he spoke to her and here's what he said. Weep not. Weep not. Isn't it amazing that the weeping of this mother moved the heart of Jesus and publicly against all cultural status quo, Jesus said, don't weep. His compassion is revealed how he publicly spoke to women. Then again, Jesus publicly spoke to the woman with the bleeding disorder. In Luke chapter 8, the chapter we're in, down toward the end. This is where Jesus knew somebody had touched him. Remember that? And he said, uh, uh, hey, who, who touched me? I perceive the virtue has gone out of me. And, and when the woman saw that she was not hid, in verse 47... She came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how he, she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Uh, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Now, the Gospels give this uh, uh, story. Matthew talks about this story and and uh, so uh, uh, I put that in your notes just so you'd have another reference. But then Jesus spoke publicly with a woman who called him, called him from a crowd. Basically yelled out at him. And in Luke eleven twenty seven, now this is a verse your Catholics don't like, but it's in there, and I like to give that to them. I got some Church of Christ verses and, and all of that, and then I got my Catholic verses. All right? And so Luke 11, 27 and 28. And it came to pass as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. She is uh, talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Blessed is the womb. Blessed is the woman. But he said, Jesus said about what she said. Yea, rather, he said, negative ghostwriter, 
This ain't. This is not what you ought to be be building up. He said, "Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it." You know as well as I do that there are people in our day and time uh, that all they do is focus and put their eternal energy in a woman named Mary. Even Jesus rebukes a woman who is standing in the public lifting up the wound that bare him uh, and the paps uh, to which he had sunk as a babe uh, and Jesus reveals to her uh, that blessed are the ones that hear the word of God and keep it. And so Jesus publicly said something to this woman. Jesus publicly spoke to the woman been over for 18 years. She, she was a woman that had a spirit of infirmity and she had bowed uh, over and she could in no wise lift herself up, Luke 13 teaches. And when Jesus, verse 12, uh, uh, saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. Now, Notice, if you will, how interesting it is that Jesus is speaking publicly to women. He spoke publicly to women on the way of the cross. This is very interesting, Luke 23 now, verse 27. We'll read this one in your notes. And there followed him a great company of people, and watch this, and of women which also bewailed and lamented him. Now, everybody listen to this. Who do you think those women were? Possibly the women in chapter 8. Mary Magdalene. Joanna, Susanna. Uh, Mary the mother of Jesus was at, was at the cross. We know that because he spoke to John and her and, 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 and all these women. These are women that he had included in his ministry and in his life. Women that he had forgiven. Women he had healed. Women that he had helped. Women that had helped him. And he's on the way to the cross. And all of a sudden, uh, they start bewailing and lamenting him. But Jesus, boy how interesting this is. He is headed to the cross of Calvary and he turned unto them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wounds that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Jesus is turning to them. Even in his time of being beaten beyond recognition, he has compassion on what group of humanity? Women. Women. I'm trying to point out tonight uh, the company of the women of Christ, the compassion toward the women of Christ. But let me give you this real quick. The commonness uh, to the women of Christ. Each synoptic gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all are the synoptic gospels. They write records uh, addressing the women uh, that have the titles that Jesus had addressed them, uh, daughter. Daughter. Speaking to the woman with the issue of blood, where we've read Matthew 9 and 20, he called her daughter. Speaking to the bent woman uh, as being the daughter of Abraham. Now that's interesting. That's very interesting in Jesus' day. I'm talking about the commonness of the equality of women. Now, all women in our day want what? Equality. They want equality. Well, in Christ, you got equality. If you really want equality in this day, 2022, you can, have, you can be as equal as any man in the world in Christ because Christ makes all humanity equal. There is not a man salvation and then a woman salvation and then a child salvation. The salvation of Christ is for all humans. Jesus came as a man he came as the Son of Man, but He came as a human. Right? He came as a human. 
And Jesus experienced as a human what all humans would experience, uh, whether they be male or female. Uh, so when Jesus saves, uh, he saves all humans uh, the same way. Male or female can be saved uh, equally. And so he calls them daughter. Jesus speaking to the woman or to the women uh, uh, on the way to the cross, uh, he called them what? Daughters of Jerusalem. Some have written that Jesus called the Jewish women daughters of Abraham, uh, thereby, thereby according uh, them a spiritual status equal of that of men. Now, listen to the letters to the church. This is interesting. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all or have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Ephesians 6, 8. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same he shall receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Colossians 3, 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all, and watch this, and in all. And then Paul writing to the church at Galatia said in chapter 3 verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, and here it is. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. The interesting thing about the women in the life of Christ was the equality. The equality. I think sometimes we forget in the church the equality of women, listen to me now, in Christ. In Christ. Now, I'm not going to deal in the life of Christ tonight about the positions of men and women. Adam was created first and from Adam was created Eve. There is an order of humanity. The order even goes uh, father, mother, children. The order is uh, God's order. Now, if you've got a problem with order, you're going to have a problem with God. But I will tell you this, in the church, the order is still the same. There are some things that women do that men cannot do and should not do. There are some things that men can only do that women cannot do and should not do. And there's no sense in getting it out of order. No sense in getting it out of order. And everybody that's right with God will be right with His order. Okay? And just as much as you see a woman trying to usurp the authority of her womanhood into a manhood role, just as sinful is the man that will not take the role, thereby the woman has to take the role. That's just as sinful to see a church where men are so less spiritual that they will not take the roles that Jesus has given them. And so a lot of times women step into that uh, sometimes not even trying to be out of role, just trying to make sure the church can do what it's supposed to do. And so you find a lot of confusion in that. But here's one thing you cannot confuse. A lot of confusion in our day about where's a woman's place in the church, where's a man's place in the church. But one thing you cannot confuse is where men and women belong in Christ. We're all equal. Men, your salvation is no greater than a woman's salvation. And women, your salvation is no less than a man's salvation. Not at all. There is neither male nor female in the salvation of the Lord. Let me uh, give you this. I'll tell you, I hadn't looked at my time. I'm still good on time. But I get tickled. Now I'm going to give my Baptist. Y'all ready for this? I'm going to give my Baptist funny. This has always been funny to me, and so I'm going to give it to you. This makes people mad. I'm not mad about it. I'm not even mad you mad. It'll make me no difference if you get mad. I'm not mad about this. I just think it's funny. One thing, I'll, I'll, I'll prelude this by giving you uh, another thought. I remember when I got saved, I grew up playing the drums. 
Uh, this week in revival, I was only a few miles from places that I played the drums in a southern rock band and sang. I sang from the drum stool, played the drum. And, and so I love to play the drums. And um, so when I got saved, the first thing that had to go, they said, you can't play no drums. You can't play the drums in church. I thought, okay, well, no big deal. Hey, I'm saved. I want to be sanctified. I want to be right with God. No drums in church. Fine with me. I was sitting, I was pastoring the first church there at Airport Baptist Church one day, and, 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 and they were singing a special by tape. Now, back then, we played it by tape. And I heard every instrument in the book. I heard, I heard flutes. I heard trumpets. I heard uh, guitars. I heard the bass guitar. I heard piano. I heard organ. And guess what else I heard? I heard them drums. I heard them beating them drums like they stole something. Rolling out and hitting the cymbal. Playing the hi-hat. Coming back. Uh, and I was like, whoa now. And I, I stopped listening to the singing. I got to listen to the music. And the drummer was, he was good on that, on that tape. And I got to thinking, now wait a minute. So we can't play the drums live and in person, but we can play them in Memorex. We can play them by tape. And, um, and immediately, I was freed from the bondage of legalism on drums. And I have beat them ever since. Nothing wrong with it. I say all that to say this. I also grew up around Baptist churches to where... <laughs> Women had to keep silent in the church. So silent that they couldn't grunt. You'd be out of line. But then all of a sudden I'm sitting in church services as a kid and as a teenager and then as a pastor and still to this day, I know churches, they wouldn't call on a woman to pray for nothing. I mean, wouldn't, I'm talking about would cringe if the pastor said, uh, uh, Sister Michelle, would you lead us in a word of prayer? I'm talking about they would have heart attack number eight. Because that ain't right for a woman to speak in a church. Now we're not talking about women preaching. But what about women testifying? How many times in our church has a woman stood up and testified? Has she not took the church service uh, attention? Has she not stood up and began to tell what the Lord has done in her heart? And every man in here is amen in that woman. I think we better be careful with how we almost have a Pharisaic attitude and a Jewish culture attitude as women being second rate. And, and listen to me, women. I'm saying to you tonight that sometimes you hold back in serving the Lord because you feel like you can't serve the Lord. It didn't seem to bother Jesus whether they were male or female. It didn't seem to bother Him at all. Oh, I've, listen. I've heard women... I'll tell you one thing... <laughs> Women at our church don't even lead in silent prayer, you know. But then they let them sing and they'll shout the house down. I'm talking about they'll let the woman get up with a microphone, get on the same platform, get the microphone and start singing, start weeping and testifying about the blood of Jesus, and I look out and the same men that seem to hate women is running the aisles and jumping the pews and then, wait a minute, sing that again, sister. I gotta hear that again. And so, Sister So and so, she's right, she's standing in the middle of the worship service. Call it what you want to call it. But she's leading at that moment. Sure she is. My point is, I'm not one to get out of order, but I'm not one to have an order God don't have either. And I say to the women of this church, you're equal in Christ. You're equal in Christ in your salvation. And when you get in your place in Christ, you can serve Christ to the fullest because Jesus is not bothered by having women in His ministry. The confronting. Let's close. Well, I know that's going to be, go over like a lead balloon. But hey, all you preachers don't like it. Send all your... Women over to Grace Memorial. We'll hey, we'll take their support. They can bring their substance and you can get another job. Amen. Hey, confronting of women. Watch this. Jesus, even though He had compassion on them, even though He included them as equal in His ministry as being daughters, just like they were sons of God, they were daughters of God, He still did not overlook their sin, right? 
Jesus confronted the women. He held women personally responsible for their own sin as seen in His dealings with the woman at the well, as seen in His dealings with the woman taken in adultery, as seen uh, with the woman that was uh, uh, a sinful woman at His feet, anointing His feet in Luke 7. Sin, there is a sympathy toward the female that sometimes the male does not get. But when it comes to sin, even Jesus confronted female sin. Just as you're equal in salvation, may I say to every woman learning from the ministry of Christ that you are just as guilty as any man if you commit sin. Jesus will confront your sin. James Borland writes, let's close. Even though clear role distinction is seen in Christ's choice of the apostles, and in the exclusive type of work they were given to perform. No barriers need uh, exist between a believer and the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of gender. Could everyone tonight uh, please accept that there are role distinctions in the male and the female walk with God? Can we all accept that? Because it is. It's very plain. But in Christ... There is no barriers. Jesus demonstrated only the highest regard for women in both His life and teaching. He recognized the intrinsic equality of men and women and continually showed the worth and dignity of women as persons. Jesus valued their fellowship, prayers, service, financial support, testimony, and witness. He honored women, taught women, and ministered to women in thoughtful ways. Now I'm going to close with this. we got about three minutes. You remember back in your notes, we looked at Acts 1.14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with who? With the women. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Now, I personally believe that when he's talking in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, that he, he's, he classifies uh, the, the apostles, the disciples. He says, these all. He classifies his mother, Mary. He classifies that there were other women there, and then I believe when he says, and with his brethren, I believe he's talking about the family of Jesus. I believe he was talking about his brothers. Now that's just what I believe in studying the text. But what I find in that upper room waiting on the Holy Ghost that Jesus promised would come on the day of Pentecost there was an equality even in that upper room to who could have the Holy Ghost. The men didn't get a portion of the Holy Ghost and the women get a lesser portion of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the main name women. I mean, think about this now. Think about this. Mary, the mother of Jesus, needed the Holy Ghost just like Simon Peter, the denier of Jesus. It's interesting to me. They're all in an equality room waiting for the same Spirit of God to empower them to take the gospel to all creatures. I say all that tonight because why in Acts 1 would they be equal? Because in the entire earthly life of Christ, in Him they were equal. Roles were distinguished. But salvation in Christ is to all humans. Aren't we thankful for the women in the life of Christ and the women in the life of our church? I submit to everyone that hears this, Lord, well, thank God for our women in the ministry. Thank you.